All right. Thank, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, I've already pulled the cord out already. I, I want to start today just by noting that we live in a period of immense paradox. We live in a society that has enormous productivity. Uh, we don't even have to go back 10 or 20 years to just look at the rate of technological development, inventiveness, the kinds of new things and new ideas that are coming out that enhance our material lives, our flourishing. But not just our material lives. The kinds of things that a even semi-capitalist society can produce in the way of cultural options, in the way of all sorts of enhancements to our lives, is astounding. It is indeed so remarkable that many people are unaware of how good the world is in terms of its overall characteristics. Hans Rosling famously put together the factfulness quiz. And he put this quiz up, and it's a simple 10 questions asking about the state of the world. Is the world getting better? Is the world getting worse? How many people live in poverty? How many people live under such and such wage a day? How many people have education? All of the various things that constitute flourishing. And pretty systematically, even optimistic people, even people probably who consider themselves pro-capitalist and pro-economic development, fail this quiz. They don't realize the billions of people that have been lifted out of poverty in the last 100 years. Literally billions of people. The number of people living under poverty today is astoundingly small. And we have capitalism to thank for that. Or at least we have semi-capitalism to thank for that. But the paradox of this enormous abundance, of the extension of our lives in terms of longevity and the fullness of our lives, one would think if you could go back just 250 years and pluck an individual out of that context in the most advanced nation in the world, say Britain, and plummeted them here and shown them all of the advances, all of the technology, all of the wealth that we now have, both materially, spiritually, culturally, etc., they would be gobsmacked, as they like to say in England. They would be astounded. The problem is, not knowing anything of our political culture and not knowing anything of our governance, they would likely think that there was a robust, consistent, moral defense of the system that made this possible. They would think it was astounding on the other direction that there was a culture that rejected the very system that gave rise to this wealth, that gave rise to this abundance, that created so much material prosperity. They would be astounded in a negative way to think that we had not philosophically, culturally, intellectually come up with a way to say why this is morally good. And so what I want to do today is to explore some of the conventional defenses of capitalism, to see what it is that people say in the broader world to try to defend why capitalism is good, to highlight some of the deficiencies to draw some conclusions from those deficiencies, to see what it is that makes them incomplete, or indeed, that makes them so prone to being corrupted. Because despite all of this abundance that I've described, despite not even needing to convince all of you that capitalism is indeed practical, many of you flew on planes, you use computers, you connect to satellites, I mean, it's almost, it's almost astounding to think that anyone in the world doesn't think even some of the most dyed-in-the-wool socialists, communists, et cetera, know, because they've read their marks, that capitalism does produce abundance. It's unarguable. It's all around us. The problem is we have too few voices speaking up in favor of it in a consistent, robust, moral way. So let's start today by taking a look at, I, I actually started and I wanted to use specific examples I wanted to use specific thinkers to really pick on some people. Uh, I won't do that quite so much today because I noticed as I was reading through the literature, I actually picked up a number of books recently. I, I, you know, I've read my Adam Smith, I've read my Hayek, my Friedman. I hadn't read as many of the current defenses. And one of the things that I noticed about some of the books, and I will, maybe I'll drop some names, Arthur Brooks and, uh, and John Mackey, CEO of Whole Foods, and uh, Arthur Brooks from American Enterprise Institute, uh, Jason Brennan, famously, Why Not Capitalism? Uh, response to Jerry Cohen's book on socialism. I noticed that in these defenses, it was not so easy to simply categorize the types of 
people and their approaches, but there were many consistent themes. And so I want to do this by approaching the different ways, the different themes that people use about why capitalism should be defended. So the first of these is what uh, I borrow from uh, Virgil Storr, the minimalist defense of capitalism. This is the idea that capitalism is like a tool. It's like a hammer, a knife. It's not moral or immoral. It's inert. It can be used for good purposes. You can make a cabinet with your hammer. It can be used for ill purposes. You can bonk someone on the head. Right? A knife can be used to stab someone, and a knife can be used to cut your steak. It's a tool. The question of its morality is about how it's used. This minimalist defense often turns on a kind of utilitarian consequence. It says, the great thing about capitalism is that as a tool, we've noticed the trend in the way that it's used is to produce abundance, and therefore it must be good. Its use must be good because it produces all of these consequences. And all of these consequences we rate as being positive. Well, of course, you might note that today not all of the consequences of economic growth and development are considered positive anymore. So there's a little bit of weakness in this argument already. But the argument is simply, what do we get? Can it build us good stuff? Can we get the goods? And the argument is, great, we get the goods. So it must be a system worth defending. Because the other systems, historically, or even on the globe today, we can turn to those nations that reject the institutions of a capitalist society to whatever degree, and we can see that they are lesser developed, less secure, less safe, less fulfilled. So that's the argument. It's great because we get more stuff, and stuff is good. Who could argue with that? Another argument, and in another argument, there's the, the famous conversion defense of capitalism. The idea that, well, capitalism, private property, trade, economic liberty, encourages people to be quite vicious. They're, they're, they're greedy, they're self-seeking, they go after their own interest, but magically, the market converts this into virtue. Right? We can have this in its most uh, uh, pessimistic view in Bernard Mandeville, The Fable of the Bees, this idea that everyone's uh, vice is gambling and, and uh, doing all of these other sort of clearly socially ill things, nevertheless converts to virtue. That as a whole, in the aggregate, vice becomes virtue. We have it in the slightly more benign sense in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, the idea that interest to, converts to virtue. But this argument continues today. There's an argument that as much as people might see criticism of the marketplace, oh, teenagers are playing too many video games because these big corporations are selling them bad video games. But guess what? It produces jobs. It produces good outcomes. Again, it's a kind of consequentialist defense. There's also the defense of incapacity. This defense rises on the level of, look, the market is actually, in a way, kind of magic because it aggregates all kinds of information spontaneously and bubbles it up in a way that produces good outcomes, flourishing, productivity, et cetera. And the underlying argument here is that no one person or group of people or smart people could ever, from the top down, constructivist rationality, they call it, impose a system that could produce as much as this. So let everyone be mostly free and we'll have a good system. That's why capitalism is good. And then finally, as I said, we have those who argue for the moral defense of capitalism. This was the most surprising thing to me. I open up books and I see people saying that it's not enough just to cite economic statistics. We need to make the moral case for capitalism. And I thought, aha, people have finally got the message. And then I read what they thought of morality. And their idea of morality is that capitalism is morally good because it's the system that not only facilitates, but in some ways incentivizes, and in some ways, even for some authors, compels us to serve others. To be altruistic, in the words of George Gilder, altruism is the essence of capitalism. George Gilder actually traces the story back, almost like a state of nature theory, all the way back to primitive economies, where he says the potlatch, where, where people would produce goods literally for, for show, not for consumption, but just produce goods for show in order to be the more beneficent, the more generous person and give them away, and that this was the origin of capitalism. So these are all the, the kind of parameters of how people traditionally defend capitalism. What does this lead to? 
What are some of the consequences of this? Well, let me quote from some of these authors, because I think this is what we have to get at to understand why these defenses are so deficient in form and in substance. So let's take a look at Arthur Brooks. Uh, so-called evangelist for, he, likes, he really likes free markets and free enterprise. Sometimes he uses the word capitalism, although he seems a little bit reluctant to use that term. Uh, in his book, he notes, quote, most serious economists also believe that a social safety net in a civilized society is appropriate to prevent the worst predations of poverty. Elsewhere, he also notes, people have a duty to help those in need, not only those close to them, but also strangers and even enemies, end quote. So Arthur Brooks, who wants to support a moral case for capitalism, says that capitalism is good with a little bit of social safety net, with a little bit of government intervention. Oh, by the way, how does Arthur Brooks think that we can tell when government intervention is good and when government intervention is bad? How do we draw that line? What's the principle by which we understand the difference between what he says is the free market, which has all of these great consequences, and when government needs to step in for this social safety net? And he says there's a two-step process. The question is, can the government reasonably solve the problem? Step one, and will it be cost-effective? Step two. Now, of course, Brooks is a skeptic about cost-effectiveness. He shows that many government programs have overruns and budget deficits and all of these things, and so he's, he's, he's on balance skeptical but he's open to the argument that cost-effective and reasonable solutions should be pursued by the government. Let's put that on the table and, and think about that for a moment. Let me turn to another defender of capitalism. I'll reveal the author in a moment. There's no reason, this author writes, why in a society which has reached the general level of wealth such as ours has attained, that the first security should not be guaranteed to all without endangering general freedom. There can be no doubt that some minimum of food, shelter, and clothing sufficient to preserve the health and capacity to work can be assured to everybody. Nor is there any reason why the state should not assist the individual in providing for those common hazards of life against which, because of their uncertainty, few individuals can make adequate provision. There are many points of detail where those wishing to preserve the competitive system and those wishing to supersede it by something different will disagree on the details of such schemes. And it's possible under the name of social insurance to introduce measures which tend to make competition more or less ineffective. But there's no incompatibility in principle between the state providing greater security in this way and the preservation of individual freedom." End quote. Now, bonus points if you can guess the author of that. Friedrich Hayek, of course. Defender of free markets. Defender of spontaneous order. Defender of limited government. Right? We start to see a pattern here. These so-called defenders of capitalism are willing to make enormous concessions. They're willing to make enormous concessions on the boundaries, on the margins, about a social safety net, a certain amount of social insurance, providing against the hazards of unknowns. As Father Robert Sirico notes, the imperative against theft and in favor of security of private property also implies caution about taxes above the minimum necessary for the rule of law and the common good. Well, I say to Father Sirico, who gets to determine the common good? What is the bare minimum above that, right? There's a lot of concessions, and so they're not giving us the full fleshed out argument about how those concessions work. Uh, one more uh, opportunity to, to see how this works. Uh, Yuval Levin, perhaps he says, the most daunting challenge confronting the friends of capitalism today is that Adam Smith was right to say that the virtues of self-command and discipline are utterly essential to capitalism and to the liberal society more generally. But he was wrong to think that democratic capitalism could produce them on its own. These virtues, in fact, sometimes run against the grain of our liberal capitalist culture, and so have to be sustained by a constant resistance and friction, and a constant recurrence to older, pre-liberal sources of wisdom. We should look for ways to encourage such changes, but we also must know that, for the most part, they will not be matters of public policy prescriptions. Of course, we cannot, simply we cannot simply will a moral revival into being, but we can help prepare the ground and can encourage its likely sources. Right? So there's a sense in all of these arguments, I think, that morality and moral concerns are external to capitalism. That capitalism is a tool, capitalism is a machine, capitalism is something that produces goods, but the moral evaluation of the system is a consequence. What does it do? 
Now, I submit that this kind of consequentialism is the weakness in all of these arguments because they fail to take account of what is the most fundamental criticism of capitalism. Marx's criticism that capitalism exploited people and that it, and it basically ground them into all kinds of awful, distorted beings was not about income inequality, any coefficients. It was not about statistics. Marx recognized that capitalism was incredibly productive. His argument was a moral argument. His argument was not that the worker didn't make enough money relative to the CEO. It was that inherent to the capitalist system, the worker was being exploited because he didn't get his deserved share of productivity. Desert is a moral concept. Further, Marx's argument was that capitalism led to the moral degradation of the people who lived under it. These are the ways that we have to answer the critics of capitalism. To defend capitalism, we actually have to make a moral evaluation of the system, and we have to understand, crucially, why capitalism, fully understood, fully articulated, laissez-faire, full capitalism, is a moral system, and in fact is the only moral system. That's our, our burden. And these thinkers, these writers, have not met that burden. And they haven't met that burden because, after all, they don't address the main criticisms. And further, let me just ask for a moment. Let me put a question before you. It's probably a question you've heard before, but, but follow along with me. Help, help me out here. So if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one there to hear it, is it still capitalism's fault? <laughs> right? Think about how people analyze problems in today's culture, in today's economy. Capitalism, distorted, broadly misunderstood, is blamed for everything. There's so little understanding of what capitalism is as a system, as a social system, for the protection of individual rights. Right? As Ayn Rand said, including property rights where all property is privately owned, which she noted was a redundancy in theory, but a necessity in today's culture. And that was 70 years ago. It's more redundant today. The argument is... Capitalism is blamed for all kinds of things because the attack on capitalism is moral, and even deeper than that, it's an attack on rationality. Look at the culture today. People analyze the source of our behaviors. If you say, oh, let people be free so that they can produce the stuff. We can help the poor, we can help the world, we can do all these great things by letting capitalism, in their view, capitalism, run free. But what does the culture believe about human beings? What does culture believe about human nature? Well, we're determined, right? As Craig noted, a couple days ago, we're either driven by our genetic inheritance. Nature determines, you know, oh yeah, you think capitalism is great, but that's just how you're born, right? You're just born to be productive. You were lucky, you won the genetic lottery, et cetera. Or maybe they have a kind of environmental determinism. You grew up in the right neighborhood. Of course you're going to get rich. Of course you're going to inherit a lot of wealth, right? We need to fix that. We need to use social policy to fix that. Heck, today there's even a, a new version of a very, very old theory of indeterminism. Right? The idea that people have no constraints on their identity, on their, on, their, on their person, that they can kind of will what they want and then demand that the state make it real. Right? That they, they, they need to be funded and recognized and protected because they simply don't have any determinants, determinancy. So this idea of the culture that is anti-rational is what is at the deepest root of the attack on capitalism. So let's turn now then to the proper understanding of capitalism. What is it that we can do to identify the proper basis for arguing in favor of this system that has produced, even in its imperfect implementation throughout history, all of the abundance that we have today, so that we can continue that pattern and make it even more amazing, to make it such that we have a capitalism and a productivity and a flourishing and a freedom that was unimaginable because that is what's possible. That is what is available to us if we make the right arguments. So the first thing that we need to note about capitalism is that it's not understood. Capitalism is not just economics. Capitalism is not just free markets, trade, you know, prices, supply and demand. Capitalism properly understood is a social system. This is the classic mistake of starting midstream. If you start with the economic system, if you start with production of goods, 
If you start with the distribution of resources, you're presuming a lot of questions. And this is what Ayn Rand points out in her essay, What is Capitalism?, which I recommend to anyone who hasn't read it. As Craig noted, I think, the other day, this is a brilliant, brilliant essay that's worth rereading. I learn something new from it every time I read it. But one of the key insights that Ayn Rand made was that the contemporary discussion of capitalism always assumed that people were already producing goods, that people were already engaged in trade, and that it was simply a matter of manipulating the variables to make it most efficient. And like the radical that she was in so many other philosophic ways, her radical approach, right, radical meaning to go to the roots, to go to the fundamentals, her radical approach to understanding capitalism was to ask the question, why is a social system necessary? What are the conditions under which men produce? What are the prerequisites to even have resources? How do we understand what is even necessary for human life in a social system in order that we may properly evaluate which is the proper social system. Capitalism, as she defined it, is the social system based on the recognition of individual rights. And I'll, I'll stop there because, I, I mean, she continues including property rights, which all property is privately owned. But that, the essence of the definition is the social system based on the recognition of individual rights. As she notes later in the essay, and this is the key, so I wanna, I wanna spend a little bit of time and, and really emphasize this. The moral evaluation of capitalism Ayn Rand writes, quote, the, it, it, the, the morality of capitalism flows from, quote, it is the only system consonant with man's rational nature, that it protects man's survival qua man, and that its ruling principle is justice, end quote. That word, consonant, is incredibly important in this context. What do we mean, what, what, is, what does Rand mean when she says consonant with man's nature? Consonant means in harmony with, in accord with, matches the conditions that are necessary for the creature in question. If we look at the creature human, and we look at the creature tiger, and we look at the creature tree, there are certain conditions that are best for those creatures' existence as the creature that they are. As we all know, if you pen up a predator in a small space, it's not really living its full existence as, let's say, a tiger. Tigers range over whole wide areas, acres and acres, hunting, living out on the savanna. Putting them in a, in a, you know, in a 50 by 50 pen in a zoo enclosure, although it may be you know, entertaining for us, is, is somehow diminishing its tigerness. Its essence as a tiger is no longer being expressed. The same is true of humanity. Human beings, Ayn Rand noted, have a nature. And it's that nature that we have to investigate in order to understand what is the proper social system. And so just to work through this relatively briefly, because this would require, I mean, not only a whole, whole lecture, but even a whole book. And, and you, can, you can pick those up outside. You can, you can pick up some of the ways that Craig has explained these in the objective standard. I just want to work through this quickly, because I think that this is the important step. What does it mean to be consonant with human nature? Well, human nature has one un arguable base fact. You either live or you die. The actions necessary to your survival flow from your choices. Those choices are intellectual choices at, its, at their deepest root. They are about your choice to engage your mind with reality, to gain the facts of knowledge, to pursue the material and spiritual values that fill your life with meaning that allow you not just to survive in a base sense, but to flourish. Your mind, Rand noted, works in a specific way. It has an identity. It only works, and it is only allowed, in a sense, to make moral choices under conditions of freedom. It requires a free ability to direct your actions toward your goals, toward your choices, toward your values. The mind does not work under compulsion. Human nature is not fully expressed when you are imprisoned, when your choices are constrained. Your ability to be virtuous, to engage your rational faculty in the pursuit of your values requires that you are left alone, that you are not being compelled, constrained, told what to do, told how to think, 
told how much to pay for your goods, told where to worship. Any of the things that we account as individual rights flow out of the observation that Rand makes, that rights are a way of translating moral requirements of human life into a social context. In order to live, to flourish, to be virtuous, we must direct our minds to our choices, to observe reality, to process reality, to think, in order to advance our lives. To do so in a social context means that we have to have that faculty left free. It cannot be impeded by others' coercive acts, whether those others are private citizens or government. That governments are instituted to protect that freedom. That is the nature of an individual right, a protection of your freedom of action in the social context. It defines and delimits what that freedom is so that we can all live in consonance with our natures, so that we can benefit from social cooperation, from trade, from production, so that all of the values that we can produce as human beings are available to all of us in a way that respects our human nature, that respects the sovereignty of our individual minds. That is what capitalism is about, about the respect for our humanity. As Richard Salzman once noted, capitalism is the habitat for humanity. It is what the proper place that human beings should live. Full, laissez-faire, unimpeded capitalism, the social system that fully protects individual rights. These defenders of capitalism, by going on utilitarian consequences, miss that crucial moral point. They miss that individual rights are a whole. They cannot be breached without breaching others. Imagine, you say, oh, I, you know, I'm gonna respect Tim's rights, except for his right for, you know, religious belief. Where, where it comes to religious belief, I'm gonna tell Tim what to do. But where he goes about his business to trade, where he goes about his business about who he wants to marry, et cetera, et cetera, oh, well, wait, you know, marriage, yeah, maybe his religion's gonna affect that. Oh, trade, oh, but you know, those are immoral goods, so I'm gonna tell him how to do that. And, and you can see that violating one of Tim's rights starts to grow into more and more areas. Rights are a whole. To protect your freedom of action means to protect all of the ways that you live your life, not just some of the ways. So making concessions that, oh, where, where I have moral disagreements about the kinds of products people produce, or I have moral disagreements about prices that people charge, or I have moral disagreements about what people say, their freedom of speech. We don't want them to say nasty things, do we? Right, let's, let's, just, let's, let's just edge those out. And we don't want them to make any kind of you know, blasphemous communication, so let's just edge that out. And we don't want them to charge exorbitant prices, so we'll just edge that out. No, individual rights are a whole. You cannot speak to someone and say, okay, your freedom of action is, un, is unconstrained, except for the fact that you have to live in this 12 by 12 cell. We'll feed you, right? We'll get you all the nutritious food that's necessary to your survival. In fact, we'll even bring in a doctor man, we're gonna ensure your longevity down to about 120 in this 12 by 12 room. Question for you is, are you fully human? Are you living as a human being? As, as Ayn Rand says, man qua man. Or are you living as a caged animal? In a social system that violates rights of any of the citizens, in any of their rights, we are not living in a system that allows us to fully engage our rationality to the purpose of our flourishing. And that, I submit, is the biggest error that these so-called defenders of capitalism make. And the reason that they make it is, as I said, they start midstream. They want to start with the existing system and say, okay, why is it great? Why is all this productivity, why are all these goods such a beneficial thing to humanity? They don't ask that fundamental question, that radical question that Ayn Rand asks, what are the preconditions? What, is it, what does it mean? And that word, if I want to go back to that word, consonant, to be consonant with human nature. This is not about consequences. Rand notes, obviously, as I said, it's unarguable, everyone agrees. Rand notes that capitalism is by far the most productive, by far the most flourishing civilizations have been capitalist civilizations, even semi-capitalist civilizations. But that is not the moral justification. The moral justification for capitalism is that we have ability to be moral in a capitalist system. As Leonard Peikoff notes, what capitalism guarantees is that if a man does choose to think, he can act accordingly. No one has the power to neutralize his mind. No one can force another in his ideas, his values, 
or his errors, end quote. And in a following passage, a free market, as we know, is a corollary of a free mind. The point here is also the converse. A free mind is a corollary of a free market. Markets allow people to be fully free, but they have to exist in a social system that protects all of their rights. This is how we develop the virtue of independence, the virtue of integrity, of productiveness, pride, etc. You cannot have those without the full freedom of action. To think otherwise is to hold a view of the good that says that I can force the good on you. Imagine a friend, somebody you like, somebody you care for, who systematically makes his or her decisions, I guess I said his, so his decisions in a way that you know is contrary to his interests. Right? Uh, when he decides to get dating advice, he consults his, uh, his tarot card reader. When he decides what to do, invest in the stock market, he throws a dart. Uh, when he decides how to uh, you know, path out his career, he, he consults astrology. We know that those methods are contrary to his, his accomplishment of his interests. But it is actually a harm, a bad thing, if we compel him to use the right method. Because that material value, a higher stock return, that spiritual value, a better match on his dating profile, those are not goods to him if he is not free to use the actions of his own mind in pursuit of those values. In the same way that the nutritious, delicious, life-enhancing food that the state could provide to you in that 12 by 12 cell is not actually good for you. You are not the one being productive to achieve those values. You're not the one choosing those values. Without that, you are a mere form of a human. You are not fully human. And this has a deeper psychological value as well. Capitalism is not only the system that allows us to be fully moral. It's, a, it's the system that allows us ultimately to translate those virtues into our birthright as human beings, into happiness, into psychological well-being. And so I wanna, I wanna extend this analysis a little bit and, and, and maybe be, uh, uh, not controversial, but a little bit, a little bit uh, speculative, and to suggest that one of the challenging points to grasp about the defense of capitalism is that it's not just a defense of how we live our lives morally, it's about how we live our lives psychologically. Now, I'm not a psychologist, as Sarah introduced, I'm a historian, but what strikes me when I read some of the best psychological literature about happiness, about what it means for someone to have a fully integrated sense of self, to flourish, to be, to be a productive member of society is that it requires that kind of freedom and independence that is exactly the hallmark of the virtues that Ayn Rand talks about. Some of the best literature, Albert Bandura's idea of self-efficacy, tracks very well with the idea of self-esteem. The idea that we need to feel competent and capable and worthy of achieving our values. That people without this, this key psychological makeup are not fully expressing their human values, their needs, their selves, right? Uh, Richard Desi and, and, and his group at, uh, at uh, Buffalo have, have developed this self-determination theory, that we have to have a kind of autonomy, that people who own their own choices and own their own integrity have better psychological outcomes, that the kinds of defense mechanisms and the kinds of maladaptive behaviors Right? And, and if you just think about the maladaptive behaviors we see under non-free systems today, those maladaptive behaviors are because people are not fully human. They do not live under a system that respects their rights fully in an integrated, complete sense. And that causes a diminution of their ability to be fully human. It degrades that. If we are going to defend capitalism, we cannot defend capitalism simply because we get more iPhones, because we get more stuff. And we cannot do it simply because we say, well, look at the alternatives. Or, gosh, it's the best system besides all the others. Right? Or it's the, it's the worst system, but it's the best besides all the others, a kind of Churchillian defense of capitalism. We have to defend capitalism because it is not only morally good, but it is the only system that allows moral action that allows us the freedom to choose those actions that are necessary for our survival. And it's important to note as well, 
that capitalism is not a kind of system of guarantees, right? The idea that the utilitarians make this argument, oh, capitalism gets all this stuff. What, when, what happens when it doesn't? What happens when there's a recession? What happens when there's a market dislocation? What happens when we say, oh, yes, it gets a lot of stuff, but these people at the bottom aren't getting as much as they should? Well, that's where the concessions come in. There's a profound lack of recognition that what capitalism does is it guarantees the conditions under which human beings can fully express themselves, can make the choices to be virtuous. It does not guarantee that. Capitalism does not magically compel virtue, but capitalism does facilitate it. Capitalism does not guarantee a kind of meritocracy. Capitalism is often defended as being the system where merit, uh, you know, that rewards, that merit follows along with hard work. But that's not true. And it shouldn't be true. Human beings, volitional, rational human beings, are fallible. The best of intentions does not always follow through with material consequences. The person with the most integrity doesn't always win. Right? Turn to page, I don't know, say 350 of The Fountainhead and tell me what you think Howard Works doing. He's certainly the person with the most integrity. He's certainly the most rational person in the book. Is he succeeding? Well, as Ayn Rand notes, on one level, yes. But on another level, no. If we're measuring it merely by his material circumstances, he's working in the quarry. Right? He's not building commissions for famous people. He's not designing the buildings he wants to design. He's doing what he has to do to keep his integrity to be who Howard Rourke is. But capitalism, you know, and, and, and it's interesting, The Fountainhead doesn't really depict the social aspect. It's, it's much more psychological and, and moral novel. The social system, we don't really see that there are government controls preventing Howard Rourke from achieving his values. It's not the world of Atlas Shrugged, right? It's not the world where, where the state is, is clamping down on the producers. It's simply a world that doesn't recognize his artistic genius. So capitalism is not the system that guarantees results. That's the wrong way of looking about it. Capitalism is the system that guarantees the opportunity for morality. Moral people appropriately live in a free society. That's the only system that we can have if we want to be fully moral. So I submit to you that what we need to defend capitalism is a robust, consistent, moral defense of capitalism. We cannot survive with anything less. We are not fully human. We are not fully free. We are not going to fully flourish without it. But as Ayn Rand once noted, despite all of the things in the world today, let alone those in her life, we don't have it now. We don't have a system of capitalism. We haven't ever had a system of capitalism fully, consistently, across the board protection of individual rights. But we can fight for it. We can articulate it. We can show what it might look like. And we can show all of those ways. You don't have to be an economist to defend capitalism. You just have to be someone who believes in moral action. And if you do that, and you support capitalism, and you do it in the way that says that it is the system of morality, then as Ayn Rand noted, you can fight for the future, but live in it today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, well, I promised Craig I would leave as much time as possible for questions. It looks like I left a fair bit of time. So just one quick note. Um, we would, uh, I would personally appreciate, and in fact, I might go into teacher mode. I would appreciate it if you keep your uh, questions brief and direct, uh, and maybe I'll even cut you off if you don't. So no pressure, Nick. <laughs> go ahead. Hey, um, I think from university I read from the philosopher Martha Nussbaum who said that in the name of living as a full human being, we should give people the basic necessities, food, healthcare, social welfare, things like that, because if those people have those things, then in the future, they can improve their lot in life. So what would you say to that? that yeah, that, I mean, so Nicholas asks, if, for those who didn't hear it, uh, Martha Nussbaum, the philosopher, says that in order to be fully human, you need those basic necessities, right? Well, let me ask Martha, hey, Martha, uh, how do you procure those necessities? 
right? This is the consistency question. This sounds nice. It sounds like, yeah, I mean, hey, if we all had $50,000, we'd, you know, we'd be able to start off life a little bit easier when we graduated college, if we had, didn't, didn't have any debt, if we had someone providing food, shelter, clothing for us, we, we'd be able to be, express our humanity. But at what cost? Number one, there's the cost to the person that you have to expropriate those goods from. Right? So you're living in a society that has pockets of violation of rights and pockets of you know, supporting people's humanity. But the other problem is that what I think is more important is that Nussbaum ignores the damage to you. Right? It's not just that in order to provide you free food, I have to steal it from someone else. Because you know, maybe she can argue that someone would donate it, et cetera, et cetera. I infantilize you. I reduce you to someone who cannot engage in that virtuous activity by short-circuiting the process by which your mind leads you from your choice to think, your choice to act, your choice to accomplish your values. What I am doing is I'm putting a penny in your fuse box, for those of us you know, old enough to remember how you used to, people used to do that. I don't think, the fuses aren't like the break, everybody's got breakers now. But I'm basically short-circuiting your abilities and your development of your humanity by, by, uh, by taking away that process of development in you. Not just in the other people who, I mean, and I care about those other people, obviously, I don't wanna violate their rights in order to serve your humanity, but I'm actually diminishing your humanity. What Nussbaum and others who have this argument about a kind of bare minimum or, or a base standard that's necessary for us to be fully human, what they don't recognize is that they're thinking of humanity as merely a physical attribute, right? They're thinking of flourishing as merely just being alive. They're ignoring the intellectual, the cognitive component to independence, to all the other virtues. And that's what they're harming in that. Think about child development, right? You say, oh, well, for my son, for my daughter, to be fully human, I'm gonna take care of all their needs until they're 18. Literally, take care of all their needs. I'm not gonna give them any opportunity to learn, to try and fail, to correct their mistakes, to engage their own mind with reality, to, to go out and try to understand the world. I'm gonna do all of that for them. I'm gonna give them food, toys, I'm gonna do everything that keeps them amused. And then I'm gonna launch them into the world at 18. How successful are they gonna be? They're gonna fall flat on their face, right? And, and, and you know, it turns out I actually have, uh, I, I feel like, uh, uh, you know, Ion has, has something to it when I've got pages and pages of, of examples and notes that I gathered during this process of preparing this lecture. But there, there is a very interesting quote, the, the psychological element, and this, and this I think helps capture it. If you do not allow people in a free society to fully have the sense of what it means to be a rational, choosing, free adult, you're going to basically reduce them to dependence. You're going to reduce them to a kind of intellectual dependence. And I, I pulled this quote from Maria Montessori, who, uh, for those of you who know, has a system of educating children in a way to develop and cultivate their independence. Uh, she writes, the stronger we are in such exercises, making decisions, uh, the more independent we shall be of others. Clarity of ideas, the mechanism of the habit of decision, gives us a sense of liberty. The heaviest chain which binds us in a humiliating form of slavery is the incapacity to make our own decisions and the consequent need to refer to others. The fear of making a mistake, the sense of groping in the dark, of having to bear the consequence of an error we are not certain to recognize, makes us run behind another person like a dog on a chain. We shall finally fall into an extremity of dependence. We shall no longer be able to dispatch a letter or buy a pocket handkerchief without asking advice. For Martha Nussbaum to advocate that the way to cultivate your full humanity is by diminishing your cognitive ability and your moral ability to make choices is in essence saying that your full humanity requires dependence. I say it does not. I say human beings are born with the birthright of independence and we deserve the social system that gives us that capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, many young people today have been led to believe, even indoctrinated to believe, that capitalism is um, the pursuit of wealth and stuff at the expense of everything else. And that can be a very strong belief. Would you recommend a strategy to start trying to get around that wall? Yeah. So the question is, the, the common belief that is not only probably pervasive, but probably indoctrinated into many people today is that the essence of capitalism is the, is the unceasing pursuit of wealth. As, as almost in some, in some cases they say, it's so sort of the sole value, that that's all capitalism is about. And that is a very difficult, uh, a difficult thing to overcome because is wealth pursuit 
a bad thing? No, of course not. Wealth pursuit is a good thing. But like any good thing in, in a rational life, one has to account for one's hierarchy of values, right? And one has to understand that, and, and I think part of the, the wedge to get into this with people is to note that, is to start with that redefinition of capitalism as a whole social system. Because I think that that view comes from the mistaken idea that capitalism is merely how we order our economic affairs. We have to, we must, we absolutely need to talk about individual rights. As Craig says, we have to know what they are, where they come from, and how we know it. That is essential. And that is the wedge by saying, look, yes, wealth pursuit is part of capitalism. In fact, it's, it's necessary. Profit is necessary. It is, you know, you're, you're a human being. You've got to live or die. Profit means that you've produced more and have a farther horizon before your death. Right? Profit is that I have more grain than I did yesterday that I gathered, or that I killed more animals so that I can live for a month rather than a day. Profit is merely the recognition that your horizon of survival is farther out into the future. Wealth creation, wealth pursuit, is that same thing. But just like water is a value, just like food is a value, just like anything else is a value, just like uh, you know, recreation is a value, just like romance is a value, none of those values exist in isolation. They are contextual absolutes, as Ayn Rand calls them. They are things that we pursue within a hierarchy of values in our life. And capitalism supports the various and, and almost infinite variety of hierarchies that people choose. So for some people, say in their early 20s, wealth pursuit is the number one value. It is the thing that they will get a lack of sleep, a lack of you know, proper you know, sanitation of their own self. You, know, the, you, know, you, you, you go into Silicon Valley, you can find a, a team of entrepreneurs you know, they don't sleep, they don't bathe, they barely eat, but they work. They pursue wealth. But not as an end in itself, right? The end is flourishing, is the full human life. Wealth is a means to serve that. And what we need to understand is that at a certain point that those founders step back. They start bathing again, right? They, they re-enter society, they find dates, right? They settle down, they have children, they have a family, they do all the things that the rest of us do. Wealth pursuit is still part of their life, but its hierarchy has changed. But we can't understand that hierarchy if we think of capitalism solely as an economic pursuit. We have to think of it as the whole social system that supports all of the variety of values that people pursue and their freedom to make those hierarchical decisions on their own, right? Not to have that dictated to them, that this is the value you pursue now and this is the value you pursue now, or this is the value you pursue and we take a part of it so you have to pursue it for longer to get what you want out of it. That's the argument that we can get that wedge issue in by redefining capitalism or actually properly defining capitalism as the full protection of individual rights in a social system, and then saying, so what does that mean for everyone? Does it really just encourage wealth creation or does it encourage production of art? Does it encourage the production of cultural values, the production of spiritual values? All of the things that are part of a full human society, there are people pursuing those things. But profit and wealth are the means of doing those. You can't, you can't survive if you don't have a horizon more than tomorrow. And that's what wealth represents, right? It is, it is productivity. Uh, form that allows you to extend out your life. Yep. Carrie Ann. Since the strategy of uh, providing a moral defense for capitalism is so complex and nuanced, uh, one aspect of how a lot of people are drawn toward views like Marxism is because they actually name real phenomena. People are alienated. Some people are impoverished. Some people are exploited. So how might you direct them? as in your experience mm. as a historian to a research agenda that looks at the real causes of those sorts of phenomena so that they don't keep blaming it on capitalism. Yeah, so the, the tree falling in the forest problem, right? I mean, baby food so shortages, you know, toilet paper shortages, it's all capitalism, right? It's never government regulation, it's never anything. So Carrie, the, Carrie Ann, the answer I think is, you're right. The reason why a lot of people are attracted to anti-capitalist ideas is that those anti-capitalist programs socialism, welfare statism, et cetera, promise to solve real world problems, right? Are there people in poverty today? Absolutely. Are there people who have needs that are not being met? Absolutely. Are there people who uh, are, are in situations where they cannot find productive work through no fault of their own, literally because the government has regulated them out of work, et cetera? Absolutely. I think that the answer, and this, and this may sound like a deeply self-interested answer, but I, I think that the, the proper answer is, there is no substitute for knowing the facts. If you want to engage people, anyone, not just Carrie Ann, but anyone, if you want to engage people on the topic of capitalism 
and its, you know, and its supposed ills and benefits, you must know the history of whatever society you're in, America or otherwise. Because if you don't, if you don't have ready access to examples, ready access to say no, in fact, you know, that, that crisis was caused by the government manipulation of the money supply. You don't have to be an expert on all of these things, but you have to know in principle the broad swath of the history that sets up the world that you live in today. Without that knowledge, I mean, Cicero was, was right, right? Cicero noted that not to know what happened before one was born is to always be a child. Nescire autem sed ante quam autus sisa, that's for Tim, just because I know he loves the Latin. So yeah, to be, to be ignorant of the past is to be a child. If you want to support the system that helps you flourish, you have to be able to answer those questions. You have to be able to note that the pervasive universal condition of humanity prior to capitalism was bare subsistence. And that the things that launch that hockey stick graph that the, that the economic defense of capitalism always likes to point to, it's not wrong to point to those things. It says you have to be bolstered with the moral arguments. And so when that hockey stick graph takes off in the Enlightenment period, in the 18th and 19th century, when humanity starts producing not just subsistence, but wealth, real wealth, the answer to that is, the, and I've, oh, I've forgotten the historian, but the four horsemen of the anti-capitalist you know, apocalypse, hunger, famine, you know, all, all of the things were around before capitalism. We inherited war, famine, all of these things. Those were part of humanity. Capitalism is working to solve Things. Why? Because it's enabling moral action. So when those things are still part of our society, it's only through voluntary moral action that we can actually solve them. So I think that's the sort of flipping it on its head and saying you've got to know the history, you've got to know the background in order to answer those questions, because those are real questions. Right? They're not just questions about, about false theories of capitalism, they're real human phenomena. So yeah, I agree, you, have to, you really have to engage those. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, one question that I struggle with myself is why is capitalism, the word capitalism, the best term to denote the fully moral social system? Because it seems to kind of start midstream with an economic concept about capital and, you know, what are some plausible alternatives? Sure. Do you still think capitalism is the best word and why do you think it's the best word? Good, good, great question, great question. So I will give you a brief answer. I'll also point you to an essay I wrote. Um, so I have a, a substack as part of some of my work at the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism. If you're curious, uh, the very first essay, I think, was uh, on the nature of the word capitalism and its, its origin and some of those things. It's just exploringcapitalism.substack.com. Uh, it hasn't been updated in a while. There's been some changes in uh, uh, some of the demands on my time, but I hope to get back to it soon. There's, there's a number of essays there. If you're interested, you, know, you can subscribe, you can go look at the post. But in essence, I'm, I'm, I'm torn sometimes. Capitalism was invented by its enemies, the word, right? It was, it was the French socialists, actually. Uh, and then Marx borrowed it on, on small occasions. And then it was really the earliest 20, 20th century Marxists who put this term into the lexicon. And it was used primarily in the early part of the 20th century as a negative term. And then in the 1930s and 40s, with the rise of fascism and totalitarian communism, uh, it became a term of differentia that the capitalism was in the West and, and totalizing states were, you know, were the Soviets, the Nazis, et cetera. And it became kind of a mantra. And that's exactly the time that it became diminished in its understanding. And so I, I definitely understand that the historical track record of the word capitalism has all of these latent associations in the same way that the word self, selfishness does. And the, the question that we have to answer ourselves is, is it worth saving? Is it worth defending? Is it worth standing up for? I think, at least I'm convinced right now, <laughs> I'm open, I'm open, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I may change my mind on this, but right now I am convinced it is the right term. And, and part of that is because there is a unique etymological piece in this, that despite the fact that say, what is somebody who, who's, you know, what is somebody who supports socialism? A socialist. What is somebody who supports communism? A communist. What is somebody who supports fascism? A fascist. What is somebody who supports capitalism? A businessman. Right? I mean, the word capitalist actually is more traditionally associated with the person who has excess capital that invests it productively in the market. It comes from a, a job, not a ideology, because it was not named until the ideology was already part of society. But the word itself, the, the etymology of the word, actually has a really unique uh, kind of history, and, and it was unintentional. The word capital in the 18th and 19th century to, to designate you know, gold or, or other uh, resources, ultimately comes from caput, which is the Latin word for head. 
And so it's sort of the system of the mind, right? Capitalism, and which is true, capitalism is the system of the mind. If the mind is the ultimate root of our rationality and our moral choices, then capitalism is the system that best protects that. Now, that's a lot of work for us to do, to remind people of this etymology and to go back to that. But I think, at least because of that, I, I feel as though it's worth keeping the term. I, I just don't think that any of the available alternatives, free enterprise, free market, those are even more excessively economic orientation. I think that focusing on capitalism as a social system and reminding people that this is not what we have now. It is not what we've had historically. We have only approached it, right? The whole, well, what, we haven't really ever tried socialism. Yeah, we haven't tried capitalism either, right? But I can tell you that the bit that we've tried shows unarguably that the moral system is capitalism because there aren't people in chains. There aren't people in gulags. There are people who have freedom to exercise their minds in pursuit of their values, unconstrained by the state, unmolested by their friends. Yes. Um. How do you think uh, that the explanation of economic models affect the moral case for capitalism? In a sense, I've attended a lot of microeconomics classes, and they all start with the classic economic graph with the supply and demand curve, and there are these two triangles, the producer surplus and the consumer surplus. And it seems that uh, the only goal of the economy and political economy is to reducing the producer surplus as much as possible. So do you think this affects how, how our, our consideration about capitalism? This affects our vision of business pen and entrepreneurs? And how can we fix it? Yeah, uh, I do. I think that despite the insight and analysis and, and in real ingenuity of the economics profession, that there is an element of economics in the different schools of economics, right? Because that, that kind of neoclassical, you know, classic supply and demand curve, disaggregated from human action, disaggregated from real people in a way that uh, assumes away all of the variables, right? And says, you know, okay, I'll share a joke. So uh, an economist, a chemist, and a physicist are trapped on an island. And the, the cans of food wash up. Okay, and they have no can opener. So the physicist says, we're gonna drop the cans off of this really high cliff on the island, they're gonna drop onto the rock, and they're gonna pop open, and then we're gonna eat the food. And the chemist says, no, 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 you're so silly. We're gonna put them in this salt water, and then I'm gonna take some of this fruit, and it's gonna be acidic, and I'm gonna squeeze it in there, and we're gonna make this concoction, and it's gonna wear away the cans, and then we're gonna get the fruit. And the economist says, no, 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 just assume we have a can opener, right? <laughs> it, it assumes away too much, okay? It assumes away too much. Right? We need to translate the knowledge of how disembodied markets on graphs and charts work to real people. I think one of the best things that I've seen, and, and this is in pockets, in the economics profession, is to use more real world examples, not just this disembodied kind of thing. Because I think you're right, using that purely statistical, you know, producer surplus, consumer surplus, using it as a mental model has enormous value to understand the way that certain markets work. But as an introduction to the field of how trade enhances human life, it's pretty poor. I think most economics departments would benefit from having an introductory course that wasn't intro micro or intro macro with all of these charts and graphs, but intro to human productivity and flourishing, right? To show that the root of productivity is the intellect, that people produce goods in order to enhance their lives. You know, all of the things that we're talking about today, if they had a course on basic economic thought like that, that would allow them to then transition into the technical, mathematical, complex understanding of markets. But as Ayn Rand once noted in a letter to Leonard Reed, the, the first president and the founder of FEE, she said, people don't accept collectivism because of bad economics. People accept bad economics because of collectivism. We have to start at the primary. We cannot win the war with, the, with fancy charts and graphs. They prove our point, right? This is the irony, is that they prove our point. Capitalism does work, it does produce the goods, but it's not convincing anyone. And you can just look to the legislatures and the newspapers and the media today, who reads newspapers, Twitter and everything else today, and you can see, you can bury them in graphs. It's not gonna move the needle one bit. And unfortunately, economics starts with the graphs. So yeah, I think it, I think it does put us at a slight disadvantage. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is probably going to be the last question. I'm, I'm certainly available for the rest of you in line that didn't get a chance. I, I'm happy to chat with you afterwards, but I know we need to get everybody moved out. So I'll, I'll let this be the last question. And if you want to follow up with me afterwards, I'm happy to.
Yes, hi. Uh, you started out by identifying the contradiction that generally society seems to live by today, which is what, you know, enjoying the fruits of capitalism while advocating uh, the morality of you know, what, would, what would make it impossible. So since we know that contradictions can't re exist in reality, uh, what do you think the tipping point will look like uh, if and when it comes? That's a great question. I refer you to the panel discussion yesterday. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but I think there's some, there's some real insight there, right? I mean, some of the things that Peter and Craig and Ion and, and Tim said yesterday are exactly the kinds of questions that we need to be asking. The broader cultural contradiction of embracing the morality that undercuts our material prosperity, I think, and, and again, as a historian, I once promised myself that I would only make predictions sometime about 100 years in the future because I could guarantee my own demise before then. No matter what my longevity is, I don't think 140 is on the table, but maybe, I don't know. Carl might convince me otherwise. Uh, but, uh, you know, I always want to make predictions when I'm not going to be around to be proven wrong. Uh, but I, I, what I would say is, because uh, that's what good historians do, they know that you put that time horizon far enough out that you're not going to be around. People laugh at you in the past, but... Uh, the kinds of things that we see today, where increasing controls, increasing command economy, uh, and I think one of the other signs is that when economy, like our economy, turns away from innovation and progress, like what Jason was talking about yesterday, turns away from bold thinking, from the kind of conceptualization of, uh, of radical new ideas for solving human problems, and it becomes more of a grind, right? The, the, the contradiction manifests itself in the form of slow, maybe growth, maybe not growth. I mean, we don't, we don't suddenly go back to the Stone Age, right? Because as it turns out, this kind of productivity, this kind of pockets of freedom that produces the things that we have today, despite the morality that contradicts it, doesn't work one-to-one. -one. Freedom, as Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park, like life uh, fi finds a way. Right? It finds those pockets of innovation. It finds those ways around the controls. But as those controls and as that intervention gets more and more pervasive, one starts to see fewer and fewer of those innovative ideas. And that's when we start living more and more on the capital of the past. We start diminishing our seed stock. We start drawing down our reserves. Now, the great thing, and I think the encouraging thing, the optimistic thing, is man, we've got a lot of reserves. Capitalism has produced enormous wealth, but it doesn't produce unlimited time. We have to act to defend the system. Because if we draw down that, I mean, just, you know, ironic to end my talk on economic statistics, but if you just change, like if you go back to the 1930s and just change the, the economic growth rate by about a percent, you have the average income today. The, the aggregation over time, I mean, this is the compound interest problem, people don't get it. But if you just slow down the growth rate, as we are doing today, through trillions, if not you know, quadrillions of dollars of debt soon, et cetera, et cetera. If we slow down our economic growth rate, we are going to condemn people in the future to a less vibrant, flourishing existence. Because just a half or even a percent of slowing of the growth rate can literally have in a generation the amount of wealth that a generation has. And that means that if you're drawing down that stock, that, that point where the contradiction and the chickens come home to roost is sooner and sooner. So what we need to do is we need to push that out farther and farther. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate it.